<clears throat> Hello. Uh, we'll talk now about uh, this uh, famous Austrian architect, Adolf Loos, born in uh, 1870 <clears throat> and uh, died in 1933 uh, at, uh, uh, you know, 63 years old. But before I, I read a little bit about him, uh, I like very much what he said here. Be not afraid of being called unfashionable. Nice. So Adolf Franz Karl Victor Maria Loos uh, was born on the 10th of December, 1870 and died in uh, August, uh, 1933. He was an Austrian architect, an influential European theorist of modern architecture. His essay, Ornament and Crime, advocated smooth and clear surfaces in contrast to the lavish decorations of the fin de, de siècle, as well as the more modern aesthetic principles of the Vienna Secession, exemplified in the, in the design of Los House in Vienna. Loss became a pioneer of modern architecture and contributed the body of theory and criticism of modernism in architecture and design and developed the Raum plan, literally the spatial plan method of arranging interior spaces, exemplified in Villa Müller in Prague and other buildings. We are going to see that. Loss had three tumultuous marriages that all ended in divorce. He suffered from poor health, including an inherited hearing affliction. He was convicted as a pedophile in 1928 for exploiting girls from poor families aged 8 to 10. He died aged 62 on the 23rd of August 1933 in Karlsburg near Vienna. Uh, this uh, pedophile case is a uh, serious uh, uh, shadow on his biography, and it appears that indeed it was so. Uh, he had friends in high society in Vienna, and uh, he, he didn't go to prison, but uh, uh, this this does, uh, does uh, problematize a lot the biography of this important architect. Uh, why that, did this important architect, architect need to lower himself at such uh, low levels of uh, existential practice, if I am to call it so, I don't know. Maybe he hated himself because he did have problems with hearing. He didn't hear well at all, uh, at least with one ear, if not with both. This was the man, Adolf Loss, a troubled man, a troubled architect. Uh, here he is with the instrument, uh, you see in his right uh, hand uh, something that, that help him uh, uh, help him hear. Um, an intense man, uh, he wrote well, he spoke well, he built well, but as we read, uh, indeed, uh, a troubled and a troubling man, Adolf Loss. <clears throat> That's what he said. I do not draw plans, facades, or sections. Well, he did draw them, but what he meant was that you know he he thought about the 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 the, the wholeness of of, of of the the interior space of the building, which transcended you know the bidimensionality of plans, facades, or sections. Some drawing sketches by Adolf Loos. Well. <laughs> We see here now uh, approximations of plans. Uh, here we see here approximations, more than approximations, sketches of, of plans and, and, and sections. But you understood, he was searching for that uh, uh, connection between the three within the, the body of the building.
<clears throat> this is, uh, you know, the, this, these sketches are for the, uh, the, the Tribune, Chicago Tribune Tower, which uh, was a, a very special uh, proposal that he made, and you are going to see it. Um, now we start uh, the journey through his works with this uh, Cafe Museum on Karlsplatz Square in Vienna. Uh, which uh, exists, uh, can be seen, you can drink a coffee there. I don't know if it is very changed or changed from the time when he designed it. Probably not much. Now, Villa Karma in Montreux in Switzerland, a very interesting building, um, 1904. Uh, a very interesting building because you see the, 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 the thick walls are surrounded by, uh, it is as if it is a building within a building. So the fortress-like building with thick walls is inside and then around it, uh, you know, a certain level of fragility, architectural fragility. This is not very common. It's a luxurious villa. Uh, and um, it was for sale not, not too long ago, from what I understood, um, in Switzerland. Well, he knew how to, to become known because he published, he had a, a well... Uh, uh, you know, the structured uh, level of uh, rhetorical uh, writing. And, uh, you know, he was a, a polemicist. He was able to, you know, uh, provoke noise uh, and, uh, you know, make uh, friends and adversaries at the same time. But this is a very interesting building. In fact, I think it deserves some uh, contemplation and maybe, you know, considering, you know, the. I mean, it's a very different building from Villa Savoie, for example. But, you know, this building was built 25 years, almost 25 years before Villa Savoie. Uh, and it would be interesting to compare because here the plan is almost square, not quite square, but uh, the square is insinuates itself. You see at the corners and even the general plan is, you know, could, 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 could uh, accept some, um, um, you know, comparison with with Villa Savoie. The exterior of the building, of course, is very different. But this was from 1904. But um, and it is a good building. It is. Uh, it, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's rigorous. It's uh, solid. It's uh, uh, it has a level of modernity, but also has a, uh, something about it which you would say this is a, a classical building, um, a rich building. It's it's uh, you know uh, I, I like this building maybe more than most of his other works, although it's a very early work by him. And, and this is very intriguing, you know, because this is the main facade of the building, but it's very opaque. You know, it, it, it's almost misanthropic, you know, it's, 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 and, and look at those Doric columns without base, you know, they, it, it's, it's really an intriguing building. And you look at the small windows, with, again, this is the main facade. Uh, it's it's um, it is as if it turns its back towards the the approaching uh, visitor, um, and at the same time there is an ambiguity here because there are the columns which uh, you know uh, have a certain level of uh, representational uh, uh, dignity. You know the columns, the Greek, the Greek columns, but the Greek columns. Uh, lead to a, almost a, almost to a blank wall 
Very interesting work. I almost feel I, I'm probably, I, I'm thinking aloud now and, and maybe I shouldn't, but somehow I, I have the feeling that this is the main facade of a building by an architect who is almost dead. Because you see the other, the other sides of the building have a lot of glass. You know, from from the, and this is a side uh, um, uh, elevation, but look at the main elevation. And the interior is, uh, you know, here is the adversary of ornament. But what do we have here? You know, these are not ornamental; they are highly ornamental. Yes, it's the natural ornament of marble, but you know, uh, he could he could have chosen if he truly wanted marble here. He could have chosen a marble that was less ornamental. He does this in other cases as well. I think uh, this uh, was built for a lawyer. An opulent building, of course. Interesting architect, uh, uh, no doubt, uh, Adolf Loss. Again, the ornaments, the natural ornaments of marble. <laughs> Almost neurotical ornaments. I, I would not say that, that the creator of this building, the way I see it here, was against ornament, no. I mean, even the floor of this kitchen, no, it, it, it's ornamental with that pattern, with that checkered, checkered pattern. But what about here? Who would say that this, um, you know, uh, treatment of the of the uh, horizontal surface in this vestibule is not ornamental? It's very ornamental. In a way, even these uh, Dory columns are ornamental, are they not? But as an Italian uh, critic uh, once told me, uh, Luigi Prestinenza, he said, they never listen to what architects say. They, they say one thing and they do another thing. And I notice this is often the case. Now here, when I looked at this picture, I, I, I'm a little bit confused because you see, uh, sorry, the, the width of the, uh, of the door is almost uh, as big as the width of the, of the whole opening. So why is there a need for two doors? You know, uh, I mean, if I add this dimension with this dimension, I get most surely more than than this dimension. So I don't know what's going on here, unless the picture is uh, something wrong with this picture. Or I, I don't know, uh, maybe you, you, you can uh, bring some light into this uh, matter because I don't quite understand. The American Bar, 1904, the same year in, in Vienna, so this is quite busy in an ornamental way, is it not? I mean, you look at the ceiling. Is it not the, the, the ceiling ornamental? Of course it is. Everything here is ornamental and beyond everything is the ornaments of, uh, of, the, of the bottles, of, of, of the drinks. But that didn't belong to, to the architect, it's true. And he, you know, it makes me laugh. I mean, look at these columns. And this is the man who wrote Ornament and Crime. Well, he committed a crime here four times just on this facade of the building. Of the, anyway, this uh, American bar, as it is called. Now, the Steiner House in Vienna, 1910. which I, uh, I did find myself with some students in front of. Um, 
we couldn't visit it inside. It's some kind of an institution there now. But when you look at the facade towards the street, you, you don't imagine it's such a big building as you see it from the side. A fine building, the Steiner Villa by uh, Adolf Loss. The way he employs the glass on the windows is also relevant because he employs a, a way of dividing the glass um, into smaller, uh, you know, uh, pieces. And this is a, you know, a traditional way of uh, employing glass. It's not a typical modern procedure. Uh, here, yes, it's a different thing uh, at the top. I'm talking about the, you know, the, the windows around the house. Villa Steiner. It seems much bigger seen from the garden. So looking at these works, we could agree with him that um, he was one of those people who were not afraid of being called unfashionable. Nineteen ten, before the First World War, the Lost House, the Goldman Salach building overlooking Michael Michaeler Platz in Vienna, a mixed-use building known colloquially as the Lost House. So this is from nineteen ten, right in the center of Vienna. The Roy cartoons at the time when it was built, uh, you know, uh, making fun of the building by, uh, I hope I have uh, an image of such a cartoon. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at the building on the left and you look at the building by Adolf Loss, you realize, the, you know, the great distance in terms of aesthetics. A very fine plan. So the man who said that he that didn't doesn't work didn't work with plans. Obviously, he did, and in fact, the, the plan is, uh, you know, uh, impeccable. Again, the man who wrote violently against the ornament. Well, Luigi Prestinenza was right. And the ornament extends out, outside as well. It's not just inside, because this detail here, the bottom left, is from you know what we see outside, towards the street.
Los House, Vienna, an important building by him in a very important city. And here is the cartoon I was telling you about. You know, I was telling you about because you say you see here this gentleman, you know, uh, still belonging to the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which lasted until 1918, contemplating, you know, the, the banality of the utilitarian, uh, you know, uh, hole in the ground, comparing it uh, with, uh, with a lost house. Uh, someone, you know, uh, ill-intentioned uh, made this parallel. Anyway, moving forward, The Lost House. Now, uh, building from 1912-1913, another house, a private house. When I visited Vienna with some students, we came across this building and uh, I didn't know of it. And when I saw it, I said, this must be by Adolf Loss. And then we checked and indeed it was by him. It is by him. It was less easily uh, perceivable because uh, the trees uh, in the summer were, uh, you know, more... Uh, opulent than in this picture. We came across it accidentally. Interesting building again by this uh, unique architect. Another house, 1913. He seemed to like to curb, you know, his buildings at the rooftop. We are now no doubt in the field of modern architecture. I mean, how else to describe this building? Okay, <clears throat> another villa, 1915-1916. Uh, uh, he did the interior here. Now again, 
who could say that there is no ornament here? I mean, look at the walls. I'm not talking about the paintings or the books. I'm talking about the treatment of the walls with the marble. The building was not designed by him, actually. He only <clears throat> did the interior uh, uh, transformation. Now, this mausoleum, which was not built in 1921, uh, mausoleum for Max, Max Porchak, um, you know, a, a famous project by Adolf Loss was not built, but inspired the work that was built, um, you know, some years ago. Um, I hope I have pictures of it here. Yes, uh, Sam Jacob erects Adolf Loss design mausoleum in Highgate uh, Cemetery. Well, it's it's a difference between this you know contemporary work and what um, Adolf Loss did, but uh, it was inspired. Uh, at least to an extent, no, explicitly by the work by um, by Adolf Loos. Rupert House, 1922, the square, uh, very much so. Uh, I don't know <clears throat> if this was his idea to incorporate these base reliefs on the facade, uh, which are <laughs> ornamental or decorative. Often on, on his buildings, uh, you can discern, uh, you know, a certain similarity to a human face. Like here you see two eyes and, uh, you know, maybe the mouth. Uh, uh, the, 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 there is something of this sort, uh, of this sort in, in some of his buildings. An interesting way to, to play with the windows, with the openings on the walls. I mean, this was his own drawing, you know. Uh, If the window is the problem uh, to solve, so to speak, in architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, thought, then uh, maybe this kind of, uh, uh, you know, depicting the windows as black holes on a, on a facade, which is just outlined, uh, maybe maybe it's, uh, it's a way uh, of, um, of uh, arriving at, at um, some kind of, uh, a legitimate uh, solution. Architects usually, as you know, start, you know, working on a house, on a building with the plans. But there are some architects who start actually with a section, with a vertical cut through the building, with a section, like Massimiliano Fuxas, for example. That's what I read, that he, he likes to start with a section. Maybe Adolf Loos started with, uh, with all three of them, the plan, the section, and the facades, simultaneously, somehow. Towards the outside is not a glorious building. Now, the Maison uh, Tristan Zara in Paris, the house and studio in Montmartre in Paris uh, for Tristan Zara, one of the founders of the Dadaism, um, who was born in, uh, in Moldavia, in Romania. And this is the building which I, I visited from the outside. Uh, it was initially planned a little bit different. Uh, the top uh, was higher, but uh, that's how it was built. I always wonder how Tristan Sara had the money to build such a, you know, uh, a building in Montmartre in, in Paris. Well, it was the money of his wife, a Swedish uh, lady. And uh, yeah, the building for Tristan Sara whose name uh, Tristan Sara derives from Tristan Sara in Romanian, which means said in the country. So Tristan Sara, you know, was supposed to mean the name 
trist în țară, sad in the country. And this is the interior, It's certainly not the interior of a Dadaist, of one of the founders of the Dadaist movement. <laughs> It's actually quite, uh, besides the spatial uh, plan, uh, round plan of uh, Adolf Loos, It's a, it's an interior quite, uh, you know, uh, bourgeois and even with, uh, uh, you know, nostalgic uh, pieces of furniture. Uh, <laughs> not a Dadaist, no. This is not the living room of a Dadaist. Sorry, Mr. Sara. But by the time when uh, Adolf Loos uh, designed the building, maybe the Dadaist impulses of Tristan Sara diminished. And it's certainly not a nihilist building, you know, if, if Dadaism uh, had uh, nihilist tendencies, uh, this building doesn't. So the architect Tristan Tsara and Tsara said in the country, Tristan Tsara, he wrote well. And he had a polemic uh, uh, verb. I always wonder why Tristan Sara didn't commission his friend, who was also a founder of the Dadaist movement, that is Marcel Yanku himself an architect. Well, I, I, I read that actually they, they uh, ended their friendship uh, at some point, and uh, maybe that's the reason why Tristan Sara didn't commission Marcel Yanko. himself a, a gifted architect. Interesting play with the windows. I mean, you look at these very small windows here, you imagine that this is, I don't know, this space is so tall, you know, it's for a, I don't know, a Roman emperor or something, you know. It is because of the dimensions, the way he plays with the windows. The windows are very peculiar and particular in the works of uh, Adolf Loos. I mean, uh, really, you know, look, look, look at these very small windows who don't open. What modern architect would employ such small windows? The Müller Villa, there is also a Müller Villa, but this is the Müller Villa in Vienna, 1926. Not bad. And somehow, again, I, I think aloud, I, I, I see somehow in the front elevations, of his houses, uh, the deaf architect. And maybe even these very small windows, you know, like, 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 like he, I mean, who would play such a small window, you know, in the main elevation of an important, uh, you know, building? Not many people would do this. And maybe I'm get, getting carried away by uh, speculative, uh, you know, bridging between the facts that he didn't hear uh, uh, well and, uh, you know, the small window could be some kind of uh, an expression of, of, of a deficiency in the dialogue through sound between the carrier of, uh, <laughs> of the, those ears and uh, the outside world. Perfectly symmetrical. And again, towards the back, the building uh, gets bigger. And here we see what he meant by spatial planning. That the, the, see, there are various, the stair is, uh, is uh, uh, insinuating itself uh, at various levels, and you can see it from various parts of the building. So if the, there is a, a pro, uh, um, uh, 
fragilization in a way of, uh, of the distinction between various spaces. So, uh, and this creates a continuity, which is uh, conducive to, um, to dialogue with a space and, or dialogue between two people or several people within the house. In a way, he broke the box to use the, the famed uh, expression that is used even today, breaking the box. He found his way of breaking the box. Now, that house, Villa Muller in Vienna, is very similar to Maison Planex by Le Corbusier in Paris. And you are going to see now how similar they are indeed. So Le Corbusier and Pierre Jandré designed Maison Planex in Paris in 1925-1928, and Adolf Loos designed Villa Muller in Vienna, 1927-1928, uh, around the same time, but they, they are strikingly similar. Look at them here. You know, uh, on the left, the left triangle, this one, is uh, the Villa by Le Corbusier and Pierre Jeanre, and, and, and the triangle on the right shows you know, half of the elevation of the building by uh, Adolf Loos. Now we will see an unbuilt work for uh, <laughs> this formidable lady, Josephine Baker. Obviously, Adolf Loos uh, was um, lost it, uh, you know, seduced by uh, the vivacity of this incredible entertainer, uh, American entertainer, Josephine Baker. So he, 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 he made a house, he, he made a project for a house for Josephine Baker as a, as a proof of his interest in her. I mean, we cannot really, you know, accuse him. Uh, you know, architects are lovers of beauty and uh, Josephine Baker was an incandescent uh, dancer. Uh, very charming, so much so that, uh, you know, it wasn't just Adolf Loos who fell for her, but also Le Corbusier. Um, and this is the, the site plan where, where Adolf Loos proposed the house for uh, the object of, her, of his uh, uh, dreaming. Uh, this is the house he proposed, Adolf Loos, for um, Josephine Baker, of course, without charging her anything. It was, uh, you know, uh, a proof of uh, affection with a swimming pool inside. Uh, and uh, it was not built. You see here, law, the water. Here, you know, Josephine Baker was supposed to, to swim with the architect probably, you know, uh, contemplating the, the swimmer in all her grace from uh, one of these corridors or so this space, Le Petit Salon. <laughs> and the piscine. But in the end, uh, Josephine Baker, from what I read, uh, she settled for a, a chateau. She bought a chateau. She was very successful in France. And uh, this building by uh, her admirer was not built. But it's a famous project, and there are students of architecture and architects who contemplate it and know it and speculate about it and so on. And here we have some, uh, you know, visualizations of, uh, of the present. Now, if we look at this silhouette from the back, it uh, looks more like Raymond Abraham, another Austrian architect who used to sport these kind of hats. I'm not sure Adolf Loos uh, had uh, used such, uh, such hats. 
Anyway, this was the house designed by Adolf Loss for Josephine Baker. And here we see <laughs> masquerading himself Le Corbusier with Josephine Baker uh, on, the, on their way either from the United States on a ship towards Europe or the other way around. Uh, was some kind of a carnival. And uh, this is Monsieur Le Corbusier, and this is uh, Mademoiselle Josephine Baker. And here is another picture with, uh, not with Adolf Loss, but with Le Corbusier with white, whitish shoes, you know, looking a little bit frail. Again, near this formidable uh, young lady. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, all the men here are obviously, you know, if not intimidated by the lady, certainly, you know, looking quite, uh, ceremoniously, you know, because the dancer was uh, intimidating them, you know. I don't know about Le Corbusier, but uh, he, he, there are watercolors of Le Corbusier with Joseph e. Baker. Uh, they, they became close to an extent, at least. Now, Villa, Villa Müller, we saw the Villa Müller, but this, this is in Prague. So, uh, again, in the case of Adolf Loss, there is the Villa Müller in Vienna and the Villa Müller in Prague, 1928, the same year when Villa Savoie was built. This is very different from Villa Savoie. Again, we see here large, you know, uh, masonry walls and uh, very small windows, as opposed to Villa Savoie. I mean, Adolf Loss wouldn't use the horizontal band of uh, windows as, 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 as Le Corbusier did. It's a different kind of interior, although both try to break the box in their own ways. But, Le, but Adolf Loss uh, uh, accepted the fluidity in a more geometrical way, so to speak. There is something so-called classical about the fluidity or breaking the box in the case of Adolf Loss. The Müller House in Prague. Interesting, this corner here, you know. I mean, he could have avoided, you know. It looks like a, something idiosyncratic, you know. Why did he do this? I don't know. I should have known, but I do not know. But it, it is, it is uh, something uh, strange or whimsical there. built-in furniture. Again, <laughs> the adversary of ornament. So what is here? This idea to open and close spaces within the stomach of the building. You know, you have the viscerality of the plan, which becomes section, which becomes uh, continuous, not just at the, at the level of, uh, of the plan, but also at the level of the section. So it's an interesting uh, uh, way of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, 
breaking the, the frontiers between the, what is horizontal and what is vertical. Another villa, 1929, no pictures. And this is a country house, country house, uh, which became, became a, like a motel. Um, it was probably refurbished. I don't know if he used exactly this, the same colors, the same materials. Um, so it was conceived as a country house, but now it has a public uh, function. It's, it's some kind of a, a, a motel or small hotel. Interesting idea to have bedrooms, uh, you know, the beds to be in alcoves, you know, so uh, they could work quite well. No windows uh, in the proximity of the of the bed. It becomes like a large, uh, a large uh, closet. Another villa in Prague, 1932. Beautiful tree. The spring. Obviously not inhabited. Well, here maybe inhabited. Some flowers. Large, uh, large bathroom, no doubt. Now we arrive at this uh, uh, interesting proposal in 1922 for the Chicago Tribune Tower or Tribune Tower, a very important architectural competition, which was won by Raymond Hood uh, from New York. Uh, but uh, Adolf Loss had the most uh, curious, interesting, and provocative uh, project, and that's the project. You know, a giant uh, dory column, maybe a whimsical play on the very word column, because uh, it was for a newspaper, and newspapers have columns. Uh, and uh, so he, he literally wanted the, the building to be a tower. Here is a new, you know, rendering or, you know, a, a visualization of the project, which was never built. By, uh, by Adolf Loss. It is as if the column of, uh, of, of publicity of the newspapers is supporting the sky itself. And here we see some other proposals for the same competition. On the left is Walter Gropius. They were not uh, winning. And this was the, the plan of the of the entry by by Adolf Loos, as you can see, it was not, you know, very rigorous, uh, you know, from an engineering point of view. You know, you see here a little room uh, which is named, uh, you know, pipes. <laughs> Obviously, he was not very knowledgeable or interested in uh, addressing the problem of pipes more than what we look at here.
so the drawing on the left uh, belongs to our time. The drawing on the right is his uh, was his proposal. And this is the project that won the competition and it was built like this, you know, neo-Gothic uh, tower by Raymond Hood, who loved uh, the French uh, Gothic cathedrals and, uh, you know, he tried to bring something of the French Gothic cathedrals into the capitalistic uh, newspaper uh, tower in Chicago. Anyway, the Chicago Tribune Tower, again, on the left, Adolf Loss, on the right, Raymond Hood. Now, the Müller Villa in Prague, we already uh, saw it, actually. I don't know why I show it twice. Yes, here we see the, you know, the spatial plan that that he was talking about the round plan that you know other other floors and other functions are insinuating themselves from a side into the living room in this way so there is some kind of a continuity but it's not a continuity without some uh, frontiers so it's a, a continuity but also with thresholds separation and continuity at the same time. Uh, we saw this building. So this is what he wrote. My architecture is not conceived by drawings, but by spaces. I do not draw plans, facades, or sections. For me, the ground floor, first floor do not exist. There are only interconnected continual spaces, rooms, halls, terraces. Each space needs a different height. These spaces are connected so that ascent and descent are not only unnoticeable, but at the same time functional. From a conversation uh, in Pilsen, 1930. And we are approaching the end of this uh, presentation by showing some furniture by him. He designed a lot of uh, pieces of furniture, well designed, well built, solid pieces. It's clear, <laughs> architects love to design chairs. Many architects design many chairs. But he designed other things like this one, a table with many legs, perhaps too many. And look at this large uh, piece of furniture. I like this, uh, this closet, uh, this, uh, this piece is so primal. A desk for a leader, I feel like saying. Now, the Teban tools from the Villa Dushnitz, we already saw uh, some images from the inside. He created these um, stools for that um, apartment within the villa. And now I show a project he did for the Babylon uh, Nice competition, the Grand Hotel. It was not built. The Grand Hotel Babylon. Grand it is. So maybe it might be also that it was uh, to be called uh, Babylon. Uh, look at this. Is the, you know, I wonder what John Portman would have thought about this. It's a huge building, but without the vertical uh, 
elan vital of um, those um, hotels that Portman built for himself. 1923. Maybe it would have been interesting if it was built, but it was not. In Nice. That's it. So let's wish him happy birthday for uh, yesterday, because today is the, the 11th of December, and he was born, as we remember, on the 10th of December, 1930. Thank you.